What is Sefer Dvarim? If we're sitting together, we're going to be schmoozing together. Your voices are all going to be on the recording, and it's going to be very embarrassing to everybody. Um, what, what is Sefer Dvarim? Okay, that's another name for it. Good. Very good. Moshe's goodbye. Moshe's goodbye. Good. Keep going. These are all correct. What else? New laws for entering the land. New laws for entering the land. Partially true. Good. These are all partial answers. Summary of right. what's happened. Summary of what's happened. Good. Renewal Anything else? Rule of a breed. Okay, good. Uh, interesting thing, if you think about it, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little globally for a minute before we get into this, is um, what is the genre of literature that the Torah is? So those of you who were with me last session, you know the answer to this. Depends. It depends, right. <laughs> All right. If I was to ask you about Sefer Breshit, what's the genre of Breshit? More, more, most of Breshit. Everything you say is going to be with exceptions. Narrative. It's narrative. It's narrative. It's, it's presented as narrative. We study it as narrative. We interpret it as narrative. We expect it to be in narrative form. And of course, here and there, there are speeches. Here and there, there are prophecies. Here and there, there is poetry. Okay. Um, what about uh, Vayikra? Law. law. Vayikra is law. Like the only book in Tanakh which is almost exclusively law, but it is. It's in a different kind of writing. And Chachamim, if you notice, have a different approach to it. Their uh, insistence on looking at detail is raised to a whole different degree when you talk about law. Talking about Midrashei Chachamim. Um, good. What is Bamibar and Shmot? I'm going to put in the same box. Because what are Bamibar and Shmot? They're just kind of mirrors of each other. What are they? Stories and laws. Narrative and law. Narrative and law. And in fact, in Shmot, it's like a break. It's narrative until Har Sinai, and then it's almost all law, except for the Egel narrative. In Although the end, you could say, is the Mishkan is the narrative because the construction, it's constructing it. Bami Bar has a different structure, which is an interesting one, which is a call and response almost of narrative and law. So there's the narrative of the Miraglim, as we call it, and then that's followed by a series of laws to do in the land. There's the narrative of Korach, and then there's a, a series of laws of Schuyot for the Kohanim. Then there is the law of the Paraduma, and then there's the death of Miriam and Aaron. So there's this kind of yin-yang piece or symbiotic relationship between narrative and law, but they're both narrative and law, and again, narrative and law we read differently. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole Tanakh list, but how, what's the volume? One? Exactly. And it's a different genre. We expect something different of it. It is oratory, which, by the way, means that it's not the narrative with the part that looks narrative. There's a lot of it. We can't read as narrative because it's not. What's what's the purpose of narrative? When you read, uh, Avram got up and he's seventy-five years old, and they took his wife, etc., and he went to Canaan. What's the purpose of that? Tell a story. Tell a story so you know what happened. What's the purpose of a speech? Always. To make a rhetorical point. What? To make a rhetorical point. And and the and the goal of that is. To convince yourself. Exactly. You're speaking to an audience, and you want to bring them around. That, by the way, is what all Nevi'im do. So if, if you find, for instance, that in different passages in Tanakh, which are not narrative, you have a reference to a story that you know in Tanakh and it's told differently, don't get bothered. I'm not bothered that in Tilam Ayin Chet there's only seven plagues. Because it's not the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. It is poetry about Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And I can invoke what's needed for it. I'm not bothered that in Yoshua's farewell speech, Barak Chavdalad, Yoshua conflates the descent to Mitzrayim and leaving Mitzrayim and coming to the land into like a pasuk and a half and has things out of order like the Battle of Yericho uh, before Sichon Nog. I'm not bothered by it. Which, by the way, means I'm also not bothered if in Sefer Dvarim, when Moshe retells the story of the quote-unquote Miraglim, it's very different than the ways it is in Shlach. Because Moshe's purpose is different. They all know the story. I'm trying to make a point about the story. So I'm going to present it differently. Um, okay. So, say, yeah. Doesn't, but isn't there an overarching point here that, that Moshe has? The last time he left for any extended period, they did the ego. Right. All the connections were broken. Okay. And now he knows, and they know, he's going to die and go away. Yeah, I'm not sure when they find that out, but he knows. But he knows. Yeah. And sooner or later they'll know. Yeah, they'll figure it out. 
and he doesn't trust them to do the right thing. Oh, I agree. I think that the speech is very much geared towards ensuring loyalty. Uh, I, you're, you're absolutely right. But it's a speech because it's geared towards getting them yes. to the point where they're committed and you're right to give them a, a, a guideline of the mitzvot that some of them are new that don't appear before because they're about entering the land and conquering the land. And they can't ask him anything. Right, because we don't do seances. Right. Okay. <laughs> ask Shaul. But anyhow, <laughs> that's a different problem. But you're right, absolutely. So the, the farim is a farewell speech. Now this farewell speech is made up of three parts. The first part is what we call a historiosophy, which is hanum ha'histori, which is a, presented as a narrative, meaning it's the history, basically, of from Kadesh Barnea until here, meaning everything up until the Meraglim is kind of snuck in, but not really there. And then it's the, the last 38 years, very quickly summed up, and the main thing is the last few months. Adom, Moab, and Ammon, move around, Sichon, Og, boom, boom, boom. Okay, and then there is Neum HaMitzvot, so Neuma Mitzvot, most people, the, the, the mitzvah speech of Moshe, most people will start it at Parak Yud Bet. Because Parak Yud Bet is the beginning of Re'e, and it's where he starts with the mitzvah of Mikdash, and you'll become a centralized worship, and then to the Lotosif, and then Navi Sheker, and Yeronidach, and sorry, Mesit, Mediach, and then Mesit, and Yeronidachat, and then Kashrut, and all the mitzvot, right? I don't think so. I think it starts much earlier, much earlier, because I think it's following a model. Because if you look through the Numa Mitzvot, it looks very disorganized. Now, I'm not bothered by disorganized, and by the way, I'm not making this up. I'll tell you what comes from I'm not bothered by disorganized in Shemot Bamidbar. Bamidbar is riffing off the story. So I don't expect to be organized in a legal code form. I expect it to be sort of thematically related to what's going on. Shemot, I'm actually not that surprised by it being this, not disorganized, but not organized un, under any organizational scheme that I can recognize. Because God's giving me tzvot. Okay, here's some more, here's some, a few more. Are you ready for some more? I'll give me some more. But Tvarim, I'm really expecting something organized for a simple reason. It is a speech, which means Moshe is thinking about, okay, how am I going to say goodbye to them? What am I going to tell them? And by the way, I'm not making this up because we have the following machloket between Rabbi Yehuda and the Chachamim about smuchim. Meaning, when two passages are next to each other in the Torah, is that, is that significant? Chachamim say it is, Rabbi Shimon in particular, and Rabbi Yudah says it's not. But Rabbi Yudah only says that outside of Dvarim. In Dvarim, he says it is. And the examples are because of Machashifah and Behima and Shmot, and the examples are because of uh, Ones, uh, Anusat Aviv, and, and in Dvarim. The, the details aren't important right now. What's important is that everybody's on board that in Dvarim, smichut is meaningful, juxtaposition is meaningful because it's an organized speech. So then I look at the mitzvot and I say, whoa, where are these coming from? What kind of organizational scheme is there here? So I'd like, and now by the way, just to finish the picture, the Nu'uma mitzvot finishes after the second aliyah we heard yesterday. Mikra Bikurim is one, Vidui Masrod is two, and then the end of Sefer uh, Dvarim gets started. The end gets started, which is the Brit. And the Brit is also part of his speech, including Tzavim, and all the way through the end of Nitzavim. Vayelach is a mini narrative that then goes back into something of a speech, and Moshe then delivers the most, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the apex of this entire thing, which is Zinu. Right, which brings it all together. But I want to look at Numa Mitzvot. So Numa Mitzvot, again, is broadly interpreted as Perak Yud Bet to Chavav, part of the, uh, 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 mapped out as Yud Bet through Chavav. I'm going to map it out as He through Chavav. Rabbi, how can you do that? So I'll tell you why. Because I think there's also an organizational scheme to the, to the Mitzvot, which makes a lot of sense. But then we have to look at Sefer Dvarim a little differently. Instead of looking at Sefer Dvarim, as Moshe's farewell speech, which it is, but I think we have to add another piece to it. Sefer Dvarim is, and I, I, I forgot who, who, who used this term, it was somebody very big who's already long dead, which makes them right, think about that, uh, it, which is that it is um, the beginning of Torah Shabbal Peh. Sefer Dvarim is the beginning of Torah Shabbal Peh. 
So let's take a look at it. What does Moshe do at the beginning of Parake? Now, Parak Dalid, I skip because then the historiosophy is to Parak Gimel. Parak Gimel ends at the beginning of Etchanan. It's the end of Parak Gimel. Parak Dalid, which even though the chapter divisions are not ours, nonetheless, Parak Dalid is a new thing, which is a retelling of Ma'amad Har Sinai with all of the lightning and thunder and smoke and everything else that's going on. It's a retelling of Mamad Har Sinai. Um, in it, there's things that are that Moshe brings out, and there's the Torah Shavu'al Peh. Remember, you have not seen any image. To make sure not to go on the images. And then the Kriya that we have on Tisha B'Av is in the middle of that. Ki Tolid Banim Vnei Banim. Right? And Galut, and Tshuva, and Return, etc. Good. Big theological statements. By the way, Moshe does not make big theological speeches, as like very few Nevi'im do. But Perak Dalet is really where it's at. That's big stuff. That's not just statements of faith. That's statements of description of, of God, and what God is, and what God isn't. Very important. Okay, so after that, a whole piece where he introduced, where he reviews Ma'at Har Sinai with a point of how you should respond to it. Here we go. Shema Yisrael. By the way, Shema Yisrael is Moshe's. Um, uh, you know, the bell is rung. Time for the next class. Right, Shema Yisrael. You see it throughout. Very. So he's introducing the laws. <coughs> All right, so you have to learn them, and you have to be careful to do them. And now he introduces, which none of you were there for, or if so, you were a little kinderlach. Right? Now that, we cannot read that without adding a word in, which is, clearly he doesn't mean that our ancestors didn't make a breed. He means it wasn't only with them. All of us who are alive, unlike your parents, who are all dead. Unlike uh, we who are alive, we're, we are, that breed affects us. All right? So let me tell you about the breed. Right? And describes it, what he described at length in the previous parak, now in very quick form. Now, Lemor is, it's like a parenthesis, and Lemor is, this is what God said. You were afraid to have the direct interaction. You asked me to be the middleman. I was the middleman, and this is what he said. And then we have the Aserat Hadibrot. And you have the Aserat Hadibrot. Now, by the way, if you look at the Aserat Hadibrot here, they do not look like synagogue art. I didn't put it down because I'm trying to take sides on the issue. I did it because I want you to simply see a different model. All right? What is the first Diber? We all think Anochi because, of course, you walk in a shul and on the right side and up on top there is I am or whatever, you know, Anochi, right? And then what's the second Diber? Lo Yelachat Machirim and everything else, right? The problem, of course, is that not they're not divided. What? There's no command. A, there's no command in Anochi Hashem Lokacha, the Abraham Vanel's position. Special. Very good. And second of all, it's, it's not separated in the text. And when, and when Hashem refers to Aserat HaDvarim, and Moshe refers to Aserat HaDvarim, if you look at the text, you will see ten paragraphs. But oddly enough, it's the most difficult and challenging of the Dibrot that's in two, which is Tachmod. Right. But I'm, I don't want to take sides on it. Anochi is a Diber, it's not a Diber, it's an introduction to the Dibrot, it's a part of the first Diber, uh, whatever it is, I broke it up this way, it doesn't matter much. But you all know what the Dibrot are. Good. So what happens right after the Aserat Adibrot? So if you, as we have, you guys have a Chumashim here. Let's take a look together. We have Baruch Hashem, a small group, so we can do this together. Let's take a look. Um, open up to um, Dvarim, right after, Dvarim Parakei, right after the Aserat Adibrot. And we're going we're gonna to actually go through about 20 parakim of Dvarim in about 10 minutes. Okay, 20 minutes. Because uh, we're just going to summarize. That's all stuff you know, but I just want to point out the, the organizational scheme, what's going on. All right, so if you have it, what page is it on? In the, Oh, everybody's got a different Tanakh, so that's good. Nine, good. Nine, what? Nine, seven, 970 in your hymnals. Okay, good. 
All right, are we all good? Got it there. Dvarim hey. Okay, so the very first thing Moshe does is he, he kind of recaps what happened. Hashem said all these things, then he made to the Chod, and he gave them to me, and then you guys freaked out and said, you don't want to hear it directly, you want me to be the middleman, right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, very nice. What happens in Parag Vav Pasuk Dalad, the very next parasha? See, I told you we'd go through this whole thing. Parag Vav Pasuk Dalad. Shema Yisrael. Parasha Shema Yisrael. How is Shema Yisrael followed? What's the next parasha? Don't think kochi v'otzem yadi. And don't test Hashem. That's the next one. And then, tell your kids about Yitzhak Mitzrayim and understand the mitzvot are all for our benefit. Now, before we go any further, what do those things have in common? Because I'm not going to accept the willy-nilly position, because this is Dvarim, this is an organized speech. What do these all have in common? These are all how you're supposed to relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're supposed to love Him. You have to have His words all around you. You're supposed to realize His place in your life. You're not supposed to test Him. You're supposed to convey that to your kids. Now, we said, we didn't explain what that means, so here's what it means. Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. We were Avadim, Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. He did it with miracles, and He did it for, and He gave us this mitzvot for our benefit. All of this is an expansion on that, which means everything here is an expansion on Anochi Hashem Lokacha. Because think about it. Hashem says, I'm looking at Hashem Lokacha. And our answer is, okay, so what do I do? Okay, here we go. Now let's expand it and see what we're, we're, how we're supposed to behave. So then, look what happens next. Perak Zion. Hashem is going to bring you to the land, and who are you going to meet? You're going to meet all these nations. And they have Avodah Zarah. And destroy the Avodah Zarah. And don't make a breed. And don't marry with them, because if you marry with them, da 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 and then it continues with Akev, which although is broad in scope, comes back to don't take any of the Avodah, you're going to come to the land, you're going to conquer it, don't take any of the Avodah Zarah, Shaketz to Shaksenu, Taev to Davenu. Now there are tangents here. There are inspirational tangents that happen. But this entire passage of Akev is about one thing it's about Avodah Zarah. It is in Akev that Moshe retells the story of the Egel. So Moshe is saying, okay, very nice. Let me tell you some stories about that so you understand. Moshe is Moshe Rabbeinu. As such, he's teaching us how we're supposed to deal with the Aserat that he wrote, how we're supposed to implement them internally and externally. <coughs> all right, so follow all the way through, and when you get to the end of Perak Yod Aleph, you see that um, there is, again, a tangent, a break, which hints to something in yesterday's parasha, which is the brachan, klala, and hargrizim, and harival. And that brings us into the notion you're going to enter the land. And now when you enter the land, what are you supposed to do? It continues the theme of avodah zarah. Extirpate all the avodah zarah. Destroy all the places. And then there is a subtle shift of five key words. Maybe it's not so subtle. Please take a look at um, uh, Perak Yod Bet, Pasuk Dalad. You didn't think we'd get all the way through Perak Havah, like as you'll see. Okay. Yeah. All the things I'm telling you to do, Tovodah Zarah, Lo Tasunchen Adonai Lechem. Parenthetically, what, what is the makor for the halacha that if a person takes one stone out of the Mizbeach in the Mikdash that they get makot? Because the exact thing we're supposed to do to Avodah Zarah, break down the Mizbachot, is what we're not allowed to do to Hashem. Parenthetically, that is the source for the prohibition against erasing the name of Hashem. From here. Because we're supposed to erase the names of Avodah Zarah and the exact opposite. I once had a, um, a student write on a paper they were translating a Sarah that he wrote. It said, Thou shalt have, have no other G, capital G dash Ds. I said, I think you just violated Mr. Doraita. I said it with a smile. I didn't want them to freak out. I said, You just exactly did the wrong thing. You honored their gods. That's because they weren't thinking about the way they're writing. Right? They said, G dash Ds, of course, you know. Thou shalt have no other. Okay. So, in any case, I mean, I didn't. But, um, 
Matter of fact, I heard, I think the Rav once came in many years ago. I had a class maybe in Maimonides. I don't know if this happened. But supposedly went and wrote on the board, thou shalt have no other gods, G-O-D-S, and then he erased the word to like, you know, make a point. That's not Hashem. Right? That's okay. Anyways, I don't know if it's true, but it's a good story. Now, um, I don't know if it happened, but it should have. <laughs> that way. Now, what happens next after Lo Tassun came? There is a shift which only with this kind of guiding piece do we recognize, meaning when you come into the land, you're not going to do what you've done till now, which is each call Ashavinav, which we're not clear what that means. If it means Wild West or it means Bamot. But from here on in, you're going to worship at only one place, which is what? Makom Asher. Makom there's going to be a place that Hashem is going to choose to make His name rest. And throughout the rest of Dvarim, all the way until, until Mikra Bikurim, throughout all these new mummy, this, this new mummy tzvot, there is Hamakom Asher Yivchar Adonai L'Shaken Shemo Sham. Which means that Moshe is saying, guess what, Kim Dulach? It's not just respecting God's name by not using it wrongly. It's respecting God's name by going to the place where His name is and worshiping. Respecting God is not by avoidance, it's by commitment. It's both. And this is the Torah Shabbat Pei on it. This is the expansion on it. I'm not saying these aren't Doraita, these are Doraita. But instead what he's saying is that there's, there's Shem Hashem. And so Shem Hashem suddenly occupies a lot more space than one line in Aserat Tadibrot. And it informs the rest of it. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this whole structure is, like any good lesson, it scaffolds. Meaning, it's not like, okay, that's lesson one. You took your quick test on lesson one. Forget everything you learned in lesson one. Let's start lesson two. That's bad teaching. Good teaching is, that's lesson one. Let's go over lesson one. Make sure you realize it, because now we're going to build on lesson one and lesson two. The, the first lesson about how we're supposed to relate to Hashem courses through all of this. The warning against double Dazara continue as a background noise for all of this. Makom HaShem HaShem continues throughout, but again, it becomes part of the setting. So it's like, okay, we're setting up the relationship here, which is, we got a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We've got an antipathetic relationship to Avodah Zorah and everything that it represents. We've got a sympathetic relationship to Shem HaShem that is more than just avoidance out of awe, but also embracing out of commitment and the place. And now we're going to add to that. What comes next in the Aserat Adibrot? So I'm going to interject something that is a famous historic question. A history of literature question. Um, there are some early research, Go'onim, who maintained that the Aserat Adibrot is the some kind of the... the micro version of all of mitzvot. And that of course becomes very difficult because there's so many things in the mitzvot that don't seem to have anything to do with them. Mikdash, Tumah v'tahara, uh, you know. But in a different way we can expand it out as follows. Um, you notice that in Re'e we then go back to Avodah Zarah, but Avodah Zarah now becomes a different thing. It's not just worshiping molten images, it's also embracing the ways of the locals and it's also defying God's name and disrespecting God's name. We suddenly have this interjection of the laws of Kashrut and the animals were allowed to eat. And on one level, I, I would have to say, I, I don't know what to do with this and it's just, it's there and I can't explain it, it doesn't fit within the system. But you notice how it's introduced it's introduced as follows. Perak Yudalim. Banim atem l'adonai Eloechem. Which instead of it being, uh, uh, we're now 14. And banim atem, which instead of it being a, it's kind of a, a, a rough interruption into the flow, I think is actually a soft massaging of the flow and saying, remember that our relationship, which is built on so much distancing, there's also a closeness, but the closeness inheres an adherence to something else. You are children to God, so therefore, lotit go to which of course takes us back to Avodah Zarah, and 
emunot filot, all of the superstitions that they had and weird practices they had, especially funerary practices. Ki am kadosh atah you are a holy nation to God, and God chose you. And now what happens is that special selection of Am Yisrael, of the children, becomes manifest also in one of the critical um, ways in which we interact, which is eating. Now, you wonder what this is doing here. But if you remember, and, and this is a major part of the third paragraph of Masach Avda. Masach Avda Zara, And it's a major part of what we are all aware of. Eating is the most significant social activity we have. As a result of that, if there are people we cannot eat with, it severely diminishes our social interaction. We have had Mormon priests over to the house for Shabbos dinner. We've had Muslim thinkers over for dinner. That's great, but they can't invite us to their house. And that immediately puts up a certain wall. And it also means, sorry to say it, you're kind of here on our terms. You know, we're not playing with you outside, but if it's Friday night, you know, you're not letting your, your cell phone is off or not ringing, and, but you're in our house, you're eating on our terms, which creates a certain amount of control but a certain amount of distance. And then go, goes back to the issue of Avodah Dazara. And all of the eating stuff really creates that. And then suddenly we shift back to the, where we are in the Aser Tadibrot. What was the next Dibar after Shem Hashem? Shabbat. Shabbat. Shabbat is about the holiness of time. But if you look at it there, all you've got is a pattern that is eternal of six days and a day, six days and a day, and that's it. Guess what? There's other patterns of time that are sort of built on that same model of a period of expectancy and then the celebration. And that is, first of all, Masrot. Every few years you come to Shalayim and you bring your Masrot. Then there is three years, which is the um, Maser Ani. Then there's seven years, which is Shemitah. Then there is, and built in the Shemitah, of course, is Tzedakah. Because, of course, Prus Bull coming up in the next few days. If you haven't signed it, get one signed if you have a loan out. Right? And then, of course, that leads to the Eved Ivri. And the Eved Ivri is a fascinating interjection here because the Eved Ivri is somebody who has a personal Shabbat time clock. Instead of it being, because there's such a Havmina in the, in the uh, Michilta that an Ebed Ivri goes free on Shemitah, meaning whenever you buy him, he goes free on Shemitah. He doesn't, he goes free after his six years. Right? And so the Chiddush here is that, that you have individuals have their own time clock. The Ebed is bought, and he has six years from when he's bought, and then seventh year he goes free, etc. And that leads right to the Regalim. Now, there's an interjection here, which is the Bechor, but the Bechor is a lead-up up to the Meraglim, up to the Ragalim, because you're bringing these gifts to the Mikdash, bringing this to the Kohen. If it's a Kohen Balmum, then you give it to him as a gift. He gets to eat it as lunch, if not as a Korban. And then you have the Ragalim. Okay, very good. So far, are you a little convinced that there's a, an order to this? Okay, good. Now, this is the real, this, this is the one that I think is a slam dunk. What happens in, uh, what's the next Dibar after Shabbat? Okay, so I'm going to take a page out of Freud, uh, just a little page because I'm not a big fan, but um, everything that we perceive about the world is something that we were trained as kids. All right, I'll take a simple example. Um, when we were whatever age, three, four, five, our parents uh, brought us to a building with a bunch of other little pointy head kids our age, dressed in equally weird outfits, and uh, handed us over to a different adult that we didn't know. And we did what that adult said. And we were loyal to that adult. And after a while, maybe even built a relationship of trust. Why did we do that? Why were we trusting that person? Because trust is? Trust in our parents. Right. And trust is transcendent. Think about it. Have you gone out to eat lately? You gone out to eat anywhere lately? Okay, I was, okay, I'll, I was at Mocha Red last night. Okay? Somebody else took me out. Right? I was at Mocha Red. Very nice. Right? Why did I eat at Mocha Red? Why was I okay to eat at Mocha Red? Because there's a sign on it that says it's OU. So what? Because I trust that the place knows that it's going to be sued like crazy if it puts it up an OU without having the OU. 
mirtat, and therefore I know the OU did it. I also trust the OU, that the OU will not put ashgach on that, etc. It all works that way. That's how you eat in friends' homes. That's how you eat in your own home. Right? It's all built on trust is transitive. Because I trust that, by the way, how, many, how often do you get new tires or go to a, or an air conditioner repairman or something like that that a friend recommended? Right? We all do that because it worked for you, it worked for me. We all do that all the time. Trust is transitive. Okay, good. Our relationship to power is a transitive relationship. We start with what, what is the power scheme that we have as children? Parents. Parents are the power. That's Kibbutz Now, how does the Torah, how does Moshe expand that out? Please take a look at Perak Ted Zayin, the beginning of this next parasha, Pasuk Yod Chet. And this entire parasha is devoted to the power structure. Four components of the power structure in Am Yisrael. Shoftim, Melech, Navi, Kohen. And their positions as power, what limits them, their rights, are all spelled out here because we're on to the next Diber. This is the expansion of Kabedet Avichavetimacha. You have to have a judicial system, judiciary, which is both legislative and judicial. You have to have an executive branch, which is the king, which has also got its old trapments of royalty. All of them, by the way, have to recognize that they are under God, indivisible, but under God. Then there is the Navi, and make sure the Navi is not a Navi Shaker, etc. And then, of course, there is the Kohanim Halavim and the Shriot that they have and why they have those Shriot. It's all that structure. All right? Good. And that takes us all the way through to Perak Yodtet. What happens in Perak Yodtet? You're looking at the watch saying, I can't believe we're doing this. Right? What did you do today? We studied all the same environment. How long? 45 minutes. Right? What did you see in Perak Yodtet? Aram Yiklat. What's Aram Yiklat about? So what's the next thing after Kabbalah Avicha Vetimecha? Lo Tirzach. Lo Tirzach. By the way, you guys do know about the, uh, the Sinner's Bible, right? It's just for fun. The Sinner's Bible? Sometime in the 17th century, I believe, there was a Bible printed. The way I heard it was a little different was that they left the word not out of the Aseret Dibrot. Right? Think about that. Right? Uh, then I heard it was actually called the Adulterer's Bible. They only left one out. One out. Right, and they got fined very severely by the uh, by the Vatican. But in any case, all right, lo tirzach. So what happens here? Big expansion on tirzach, including a small piece about what happens if it is tirzach, not just Ari Miklat, but if it really is intentional. And then what happens next? So there is a. It looks like we've gone into Hilchot Momonot. But it really is staying on the issue of Tirzach. Details we could talk about if we have time. But um, notice, by the way, that, that we then touch on Nadim Zomin, which ends up with the possibility of murder or, or execution. Then what happens in Pasuk Chaf? In Perak Chaf, sorry. War, subset of murder, and the laws of war, and continues with the laws of war. And not cutting down the trees, etc. It's all about war. And then finding a murder victim. And how to deal with it when we don't know who killed him. Agla Rufa. Continue with war. Now here there's an interesting tangent. But remember, this is Moshe Rabbeinu, it's Torah Shaval Pat. What happens when you're teaching alive as opposed to writing it down? You want to bring an illustration. It reminds you of something else. I don't mean like in the, in the pedestrian way. It associates with something else that's related and there may be a lesson in its relationship and then you have to go back to where you were. So now, if you have it in Perak Chafalif in Pasuk Yod, you go out to war, right after the Agla Rupa, that's war, and oh, there's suddenly the rule of the Yafat Toar, which of course we never heard about before, right, this, this law about the captive woman, right? And what's the next parsha? It's really weird. It doesn't belong here at all. Which is, a man has two wives. He likes one more than the other. They both have kids. Let's give the people names. Let's say it's a guy named Jake, and he has two wives named Lee and Rachie. And, <laughs> and he likes Rachie more than Lee. And Rachie gives birth to a kid named Kujojo. And Lee gives birth to a, name, a kid named Robbie. But Robbie was born first. 
What is Jake not allowed to do on the day he dies? He's not allowed to give the Bechorah to Jojo, even though Jojo's the son of Rachel, who he loves, right? He has to favor Ruby, who's like, by the way, we showed him all deal with the problem because it's clearly aimed at Yaakov, but why is it here? So there are those who suggest that, go ahead, take the Yifat Torah, you know what's going to happen. You're going to end up with a wife you don't like very much. And by the way, who's the only woman who's described as Yifat Torah in Tana in Chumash? Rachel. Well, it's Yosef, who is a man who's described. Yeah, yeah, a girl. It's a girl. I'm careful. Right. Okay. So, you know, there, there seems to be a lot here. And of course, this whole scene is reminiscent of that. And what comes next, as is still a part of the tangent, then Sora Moret. And what's the lesson there? You have two wives. Yeah, you have two wives, and they fight, and everything like that. You can end up with a kid in this trouble. Okay, very good. And then back to where we were. Right, so we go back to the court. We go back to murder. So we're tying those two together, All right? And then, and there are some tangents here, but when you start taking a look at the clearest place to see it is in Perak Chaf Bet Pasuk Yod Gimel. There are some tangents, and each one has to be dealt with on its own terms. But I want to see the bigger picture. What happens starting in Parak Chafbet Pasuk Yod Gimel? So what's after Lo Tirtzach? Lo Tinaf. So here you have all the list of Na Rabetula Maorasa Na Rabetula Lo Maorasa Basadeh Ba'ir. All of that, and then Parak Chaf Gimel goes into. This one can't marry it, and this one can't marry it, and this one can't marry it, and this one can't marry it, et cetera. Even the 10th generation, all of that. Which means suddenly we are getting expanded, again, with a lot of tangents, and some that I myself haven't yet researched enough to find an explanation. I could be wrong about the whole theory, and it could be that there are exceptions to it. All those are possible. But when I look at it, I was just so blown away by how much everything fits. And I think, I think that's to be the, the overarching scheme, and then there's exceptions. Um, there is a passage about Kiddushat HaMachane which follows here in Parak Chaf Gimel Pasuk Yod which seems to be again about Kiddushat it's about Mikre Laila it's again about the expansion on the Lotinaf and that continues with Lotia Kedusha etc and then suddenly we are getting to financial commitments because what's after low tinaf? Now, I know, and you know, we all know, you ask man on the street, he'll tell you that low tinaf means kidnapping. Mm-hmm. Right? So go out to Broadway, I did this before, right? Go out to Broadway and say, what does low tinaf mean? He'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, thou shalt not steal. It says in the Ten Commandments, in the Ten Commandments, that in the Decalogue it says, thou shalt not steal. What does it mean? He says, you can't steal. He said, come on, what does it mean? So, yeah, I know it means kidnap because the Barlam Mimia. No, of course. That's everybody on the street knows that. Of course, you live in New York, where the streets are much smarter than, you know, LA. But I have no idea what it means. Thou shalt not. No, steal. It's okay. Um, but, uh, but suddenly there is now an expansion of all of that, all right, including stealing from God. You make a net there. You have to fulfill the net there, right? Then the rights of a worker in the field. He's allowed to eat, but he's not allowed to pocket any of this stuff. That's part of, part of uh, stealing. And then suddenly the things are starting to coalesce because, again, you scaffold the lessons. All right? And then it, it all comes together here. There's more laws of edut in Parakhafe. All right? And then um, it seems that, I make the argument, that the end of these are really an expansion in a different way on Lotach mode. And I'll explain why that is. Um, the last six pieces of the Numa Mitzvot are Ibum, are uh, the woman interfering in the fight with her husband, that thing, right? The honest measures, Amalek, Bikurim, and Masrot. And that's the end of the Numa Mitzvot. What do they all have in common? Well, let's think about what coveting is about. First of all, what is coveting? What is lo tachmor or lo titaveh? What are you not allowed to do? My neighbor has a Tesla. It's really cool. I want a Tesla. Did I violate lo tachmor? No. Not at all. I just have good taste. His Tesla. 
And on that, I'm going to figure out a way to get it from her. That's what I'm about. Exactly. Very good. That's the difference. So why would I be that way? Why would I be taking the position that I'm, I'm not taking the position, but taking the approach that I want to get his Tesla? I'm not satisfied with who I am. It diminishes him. What? It diminishes, it diminishes him. And I raise myself because I do all of that, which reflects really wrecked uh, self perception, which is where Lotachman comes from. But where does Lotachman actually come from? It comes from not recognizing all the blessings Hashem has given you. I don't have enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not, God doesn't like me, whatever it is. I've always said that, that, that you cannot really be a sad person if you dive in every day and pay attention during modim. Pay attention during modim and think about the words and, and, and put pieces of your life into it. Wow. Right? I said a good friend of mine just flew out of town because his father took sick. His father passed away yesterday. Right? We have life. Wow. What a lot to be thankful for. And there's so much to be thankful for. How could I possibly be miserable? And how could I possibly bemoan my lot? And I say, I won't be happy until I have his Tesla. Now, by the way, his Tesla is really cool. I want a Tesla. I'm not kidding, by the way. I do want a Tesla, right? But I'm not asking you to get it for me. You guys heard about what our school did, right? This is worth going on the recording. You heard about it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it? Okay, it's a great story. I found out, I, didn't, I only found out from my kid, who's a senior at the school, who uh, came home one day and said, oh, you hear about the car? They had a, uh, there's a teacher we have at school. You heard about this, right? You have a teacher, it's a great, great story, you should hear it. I'll tell you, it so you'll hear it. Uh, the guy is a Hispanic fellow, um, has been there for three years, young guy, the kids love him. He devotes all his time to the kids, stays after school, works with them, even the ones who aren't his students, he'll sit and work with them. A real sweet guy, very unassuming, very, very nice. and. Um, I did not know this, but he lives, uh, and where he lives is at least an hour away by car, but he doesn't have a car. So he used to walk, he used to get up very early in the morning and walk a distance to a bus to catch a bus, two buses to get to LA. And if you know anything about LA, public transportation is terrible. And so he would often leave his house at 4.30 in the morning, get home at 9.30 at night. He never saw his kids. And so the kids got together, and the first thing is they bought him a scooter, like a, a motorized scooter. So he would scoot. I don't know what the word is. It was scooter from home to the bus every day. So that would save him some time. And they did a project with the kids and the parents. Where they raised thirty thousand dollars, bought him a um, a Mazda, and a year's worth of gas and insurance. And they presented to him at a fake teacher appreciation day. Meaning, like everybody goes, hey, and okay, here's your thing. It's a pinata because it's Hispanic. It's kind of hits the pinata, it opens up, and there's keys inside, and there's the car. And it, the, the thing about it was, there's a tremendous chil uh, Sorry, kiddush Hashem. <laughs> I was going to say what the chil Hashem part was because there were teachers who were saying, "I've been here longer. I come on, I'm going to come." But um, it was, the kiddush Hashem was amazing because it made the the TV news in LA, it made the LA Times, it made the news in Israel. You heard about it. It's all over. It's, and and it, it's such a powerful statement of, and the, and the principal said it's about gratitude. A person puts it, right? So that's a, a, a very big thing. And the statement, of course, is we appreciate what you give us. That is the exact opposite, right? So here. A story was on ABC News, Nightly News, on a Friday about three, four weeks ago. In, a, in New York, you're saying? In the United States. You'd say, really? National News? Exactly. Wow, what a kid, Shashan. That's great. I got to make sure to practice them. Right. Yeah, call a couple. Of it. it was a great, it was a great thing. Right. And by the way, I went up to him the next day. I said, "How's the car?" He said, you know, like he's very quiet, very unassuming. He's very appreciative. Yeah, I see him in the teacher's lounge every day. Very sweet guy. It's a nice call. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. Anyhow, but it's about appreciation. And then coveting is, of course, when you're like, oh, like Fabison. How do you say Fabison? You say embittered. That's not the same. It's just not the same. It's Fabison, right? <laughs> It, you're forbidden because you don't have this, you don't have that, and I not not that this guy drives a Tesla, and I want one because I see it's such a cool car. I want to have a cool car. That's fine. I want to have his means a. I I I, I don't want him to have it, and I want to have his. I want to be like the, it's like an ownership thing, and encroaching on somebody else's life, and so all of these are pieces of that. So the last two really hit home because what's Mikra Bikurim all about? You tell the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, or Amiel Ved Avi, the 
part of the Agadah. Let's take it from right here. Me over in Avi, and Hashem brought us out, and He brought us to this beautiful land, and God, here's the fruit of the land you gave me. And then there's a remarkable line that we ignore because we get so unganumen. I'm sorry, I'm lapsing into Yiddish, and I never spoke Yiddish, but it's so unganumen, so, so taken up by the Aramio Veravi that we missed the last part. We, the speech is big. Aramio Veravi, and we're talking about et cetera, et cetera. Even to the part we don't say to Seder, I brought the fruit. What's the last line here? Now you rejoice with all the good stuff God gave you. You're only going to rejoice when you make a declaration and a gift back to God, thanking Him for what you gave, what you got, because then you realize He gave it to you. Powerful antidote to greed. And to curmudgeonlessness, being a curmudgeon, and 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 miserliness, and smallness of mind that leads to to, to coveting. So what's the very end of the of the thing? It's an anticlimax because mikrab bikurim. I would have been so thrilled if that was the end. Mikrab bikurim. It ends on such an amazing note. What's the next thing? Is vidui masrot. You take your masrot, you bring them out, and you make this statement. I've done everything you've told me. I've given it to the poor. I've given it to the lady. I've given it to the widow. I've given it to the orphan. Everybody and I have allowed them to rejoice. Think about what a powerful antidote to coveting that is. My purpose here on earth is to prop other people up. Not prop myself up. And not prop myself up for sure at the expense of other people. So... Everything up until the breed starts. Because the next pasuk, take a look at it. That's the breed. Everything till there is an expansion of the Aserat Dibrot. And Moshe Rabbeinu gets up and says, this is what Hashem told us at our Sinai, and this is my lesson about each one of those Dibrot. And they scaffold. So the first Dibar is, is alive through all of them, of course. And the second Dibar informs all of them, because Avodah Zarah is a constant theme of what to avoid throughout. Lotisa becomes powerful because I'm a Komer Shev Hashem. By the way, the Moshe of Shabbat in Devarim, what does Moshe do with Shabbat in Devarim? It's not Zechel the Maser Breshit, Zechel the it's Rhyme. And I took you out, and therefore your servants have to rest like you. And that informed, when your servant leaves after six years, you give him gifts. So it all keeps playing in and feeding the next piece until we get to that culmination of recognizing everything God gave you and appreciating it for the good. So that's a Sarah to the book. I have no idea what the time frame is. I think Mincha is at four, but I don't know if we're supposed to go till a minute to four, but we got the mic still on, nobody's stopping us. Do you have any questions? Fire away, just open questions. Anything? Wonder about the Dodgers, anything. <laughs> but that's not a laughing matter. So. Right. No, seriously, if you have any questions, open Tanakh questions in five minutes. Fire away. Open Tanakh. open Tanakh questions. Or close Tanakh. that I remember hearing. There's one part before the Ten Commandments are given where it talks about the, the hearing, hearing the lightning, seeing the thunder, all this yeah. stuff happening. Then there's another part that says, no bird chirped, no, there was no sound. Where does that come from? That, that there was, there was completely silent. Midrash? Probably. Yeah. It doesn't even sound familiar to me. Okay. No, no. Midrash okay. doesn't sound familiar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But not in Tanakh, I don't but think. No, Tanakh is very noisy. Oh, oh, not in Tanakh. Right. Yeah. So I was just wondering. Right. In Tanakh, but I'm not always saying it's very noisy. Yes. Yeah. Right. Low yeah. mode. It, 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 as you were saying, it reminded me of you know, Yaakov Esau. Yeah. So, if, you know, Yaakov and Rivka wanted to get the bracha that was supposed to go to Esau. Uh huh. Right, and he take you know it, it's a lesson to Asaph, and Yaakov gets it, but at the end that's why he gives it back when he gives all the all of it uh, when he gives back. Kachnat <laughs> birchati Yeah, right. Could be. That was the situation. Yeah, where if Yaakov was going to get something, the way ah, he get it is by taking away from Asaph. Ah, very good. I like that. Mm. Yeah. The question is, does Yaakov? That whole story very difficult. Very difficult on multiple levels. Did Yaakov instigate the disguise 
Or did Rivka instigate the disguise? Not so clear. Yeah. Did um, did Rivka really intend for Yaakov to only go away for as long as needed till I have calmed down? Because she never called him, right? Uh, did uh, did Yaakov really give back the bracha? Not really, because look, what, what did Esav do? Esav bugged out of the country and let Yaakov come in. Well, but that was the bracha that Yitzhak always intended to give Yaakov to Abraham's bracha. Yeah, I don't mean that. I mean the one, the one of, of power. Power, it looks like Yaakov held on to that. I don't know. Murky stuff. I'm teaching it again this year, so in, in, in school. So call me in June. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. Okay.